right. Well, I wanted to um, welcome everybody to today's session on paving the pathways to recovery. The Akins is our presenter and we're just really grateful to have her today. My name is Glenna Andrews and I'm a member of the South Central Kansas Problem Gambling Task Force. Um, our task force mission is to coordinate advocacy, education, prevention, hope, and treatment options for problem gambling in the community. Our hope is that today you'll take away some new information on the topic of problem gambling that can benefit you or others that you know or someone that you might come in contact with in the future. So. Chad has already gone over the Zoom platform. Thank you for that, Chad. We, we appreciate you and we appreciate Wichita State's um, Community Engagement Institute for um, hosting this Zoom for us. I also would like to acknowledge that this event was made possible thanks to funding that's provided by the Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services. There's a grant um, that they have uh, and the funding is dispersed to the task force to put on events such as this. And now, without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce you to your speaker, B. Akins, and she's gonna share a little bit about herself and then get on with her presentation. Thank you, B. Thanks, Glenna and Jesse and Chad. I'm happy to be here. Um, you know my name, it's B. Akins. You don't know anything about me. Um, I have a foundation called Laney's Hope, um, which I founded as a way to humanize and illuminate um, the disease of compulsive gambling, now called gambling disorder. Um, founded that in honor of my sister. I'm a person in long-term recovery myself. Uh, I have 25 years without a bet. I never wanted to actually early days to speak about problem gambling. And when I lost my sister to the same disorder, uh, because she, she took her life as a result of her gambling disorder, I knew that I could no longer be silent or be so anonymous that people weren't aware of, of the issues, the very grave issues of gambling disorder. So it led me to um, get more involved, started Laney's Hope to give a voice to people that are struggling for recovery, that have questions, that uh, don't understand, um, and just to, to humanize and illuminate compulsive gambling. I'm also active with the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling. I've been a, a board member there for, for some years and have done a community outreach for the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling. The things I'm passionate about are, <clears throat> excuse me, sharing recovery, helping others in recovery, helping people that aren't impacted directly by compulsive gambling to understand or care, even care about it. Um, my faith, is very important to me and suicide prevention and education. So those are the, the things that drive me. And I'm, I'm so happy to, to be here today. I'm happy for the platform too, uh, because right this minute I am in Montana and uh, without Zoom, this, this probably couldn't be happening. So where there's, there's a, a will to learn and to grow and to understand there, there's a way. So thank you, Glenna and, uh, to the task force for, for having this platform. So the topic today is paving the pathways to recovery. And that came about, um, as you'll see as the presentation goes along, uh, that it's not a one size fits all journey to recovery from gambling disorder. And so this is not a definitive list of every pathway. My real hope is to, to open up your thinking, open up possibilities, that just like every one of us is different, uh, every person's path to recovery is different. So the actual objectives today, to explore and identify multiple pathways to recovery from gambling disorder. And um, as Chad said, I'm very open to feedback and questions. If you have like, whoa, we didn't talk about that particular pathway, share it with the group, please. And uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, so the first is to identify the multiple pathways. The second is to recognize the cultural impact of how society and individuals speak of and think about gambling disorder and recovery. Because it's my contention that regardless of the pathways, if the, if the access to the pathway is blocked by stigma, by lack of knowledge, 
uh, we're, we're doing a disservice. So there is no wrong door to recovery. Uh, my mentor's mentor, uh, Carol O'Hare, who's been at the helm of the Nevada Council for many years, I think uh, 28 years, plus or minus, and a long time, uh, has shared with me that there's no wrong door to recovery. She got that from her mentor, Dr. Rena Nora, who was a, a pioneer in the field. No wrong door, again, means one slice does not fit all. Um, every one of us finds a different pathway. And for people that are, that are present here today or who, who watch later, this is if you're a therapist, if you're in the helping fields, if you're a person in recovery, seeking recovery, a peer support specialist, uh, I just wanna encourage everyone to um, be open to a door that might work for somebody you're working with that you hadn't considered before. The main thing is open the door, find it. The first door to recovery is professional treatment. Um, very effective. Uh, there are many self-help groups, which we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, the combination of professional treatment and self-help or mutual aid groups has been found to be the most effective uh, that I'm aware of uh, to couple the professional treatment, either intensive outpatient, uh, for those that are uh, blessed to have uh, residential treatment and group therapy and other therapies, um, a really powerful combination to recovery. But the first would be professional treatment. So um, I've just taken a, a screenshot from the, uh, this is the Nevada one, uh, State Board of Examiners. I apologize for not changing to Kansas guidelines, but <laughs> my bad. Um, a certified problem gambling counselor. So it's important, many people are branching out now, folks that are, are therapists in other fields uh, that are um, MSWs and that's completely legitimate. You know, therapists, people will come, they might present with one issue. And as you dig in, you find, oh, there's an underlying gambling disorder that we weren't aware of. Uh, it's just essential that you get training specific to gambling disorder because um, again, it's not one size fits all. It's not what you used for this other addiction is gonna work for that with a gambling disorder. So, Oh, I'm so sorry. So long-term recovery. This is uh, a picture that should, I, I hope uh, resonates with you that it happens in community. People connecting, for some reason there is uh, greater strength. It's true that there's strength in numbers and connecting with others. This will not surprise any of you. After the year that we've had and we're connecting by Zoom, connection to others is just so key to sustaining long-term recovery. Gamblers Anonymous. I think that most of you are probably familiar with this. And um, as I said, oh, Chad, I wanna mention that I cannot see the chat. So if something comes up, feel free. Um, <clears throat> Gamblers Anonymous is the most frequently prescribed therapy treatment. Um, I've already shared with you that I'm in long-term recovery. When I first came into recovery, it, I would say that it's, it was the only prescribed treatment. You couldn't be released from uh, intensive outpatient therapy without attending Gamblers Anonymous, <clears throat> without getting uh, signatures that you were there, even though it's anonymous, and uh, making regular attendance at meetings part of your recovery plan. That can be challenging. That's definitely not a one size fits all because it can be challenging to find a group in your area. I have been in Nevada for 33 years. In Las Vegas, there are over 100 Gamblers Anonymous meetings per week. So not hard for me to get to a meeting every day when I was in early recovery. But for somebody in an urban area, it can be very challenging. So uh, again, not one size fits all, but a very good uh, program with a long history of success and support. And just like any other 12 step program, you know, works in community. This is some of the literature. And if, if any of you are familiar with um, AA, which has the big book, they call it, big blue book. I see some heads nodding. Um, the big book is big. 
this little uh, yellow Gamblers Anonymous book, we call it the combo book, is a grand total of 17 pages. So I guess maybe, maybe compulsive gamblers have a short attention span because we narrowed it down to 17 pages, uh, but it works. And this is, is the literature that, that people will get on their first meeting <clears throat> and you can get it from Gamblers Anonymous online as well. But these are the materials, information on your first meeting, to get a meeting list of people that you can connect with. And uh, um, usually at those meetings, they'll give out um, a list of contact people, people that are willing to share their experience, strength and hope with each other. So there's other pathways and the pathways should be, oh, I'm so sorry. It's, it's important that you find whatever the pathway is, culturally relevant, generationally appealing, belief compatible, respectful of individual character traits and learning styles, easily accessible and transform lives. Uh, this is my own list from my own experience from, um, from study. And as I shared that once I began to share my story in recovery, I have been a lifelong learner. When I first came into recovery, I really didn't I didn't care why I couldn't stop gambling. I just knew that I couldn't. Um, and when I stayed connected to others and, and used my tools, I could. But once I knew that, that I wanted to speak to others in the world that aren't impacted by this addiction, um, I've done a lot of study. I've gone to lots of uh, National Council on Problem Gambling, Nevada Council on Problem Gambling, State Council on Problem Gambling, and um, training programs to understand what works, what doesn't. So I've gleaned this uh, through the years and culturally relevant um, is huge. Uh, many people will come into recovery if they're younger and they have a preconception that everybody in a 12 step meeting is um, an old gray haired white man. <laughs> and I, I uh, hate to stereotype, but I've heard it many, many times. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> people waving at me. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's hard for a uh, um, millennial or Gen X or, or um, you know, other folks to relate if a room is filled with one type of person. So it's gotta be culturally relevant to the individual. Culturally relevant, um, this is in this wheel on this page, the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical. That's the uh, Native American medicine wheel and culturally relevant um, to Native American would be very different from another culture. This one, the Wellbriety Movement, um, is anybody familiar with uh, Don Coyhes? Yeah, uh, a beautiful soul, a wonderful gentleman, and he has spearheaded uh, the White Bison Movement uh, for his community and uh, Wellbriety Training incredible, uh, very open. And um, they've invited me to their, their talking circles. Uh, it's very similar. There's a community, there's a connection like in a 12 step meeting, um, but it's got to be culturally relevant to the individuals. And the Wellbriety white, white bison movement is, is very, very powerful for, for the Native Americans. Part of, uh, besides culturally relevant, and I just gave one example of, of the Native American community, but culturally relevant, uh, it needs to be generationally appealing. And uh, this smart support, just one example, but every day on our phones, um, you know, I don't think any of us, very few of us are without our phone in our pocket next to us at our desk, wherever we are, we've got that device. Nowadays, we gotta know that that device also can bring gambling right in front of us. So it's, it's gotta be connected in a way that can offer support to us. So smart support works. Um, I'm working with uh, an organization, not a paid uh, position, but with a group called KindBridge. They are actually um, going state by state, working with insurance and um, offering virtual counseling. And all of their counselors are credited uh, it's just, it's not a, um, 
I'm not a paid spokesperson. I'm just saying I like what they're doing. I like that they're making it available online. Um, and that is especially generationally appealing. So this is smart support. Part of generationally appearing, I don't even know if hyper is still um, active. I just love this image. Um, hyper, helping young people experience recovery. I am a baby boomer. That will not surprise you folks. But um, the idea of hyper doesn't appeal to me um, because I've, I came into recovery to get calm, to get peace, to not live in the chaos that I created. And so um, an image like this would not appeal to me or would not draw me personally into recovery, really appealing uh, to certain individuals that go, oh, that looks, that looks contemporary, it looks like me, I can relate to it. Um, Hyper offers resources and events and services. There are a lot of um, uh, programs now for younger people in recovery. So again, if you're a therapist, I'm just showing these because I want you to not just prescribe the one. This one um, is belief compatible. Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered recovery program, not unique to uh, those with gambling disorder, but any type of addiction. I imagine that many of you are familiar with, with this CR. I'll tell you personally, anecdotally, when I was early in recovery, and a friend of mine said she wasn't going to be coming to Campus Anonymous anymore because she was going to CR, as they call it. Um, I was very concerned. I was, a, I was a newbie. My mind wasn't open yet to multiple pathways. And I was so concerned that my friend would, would not maintain her abstinence. And that's not the case. That was just a narrow thinking on my part. Celebrate Recovery Works, it's um, nationwide, international, and for those that want a Christ-centered program, really great, great program. Not everybody wants that. Um, spiritually relatable could be refuge recovery, a Buddhist-inspired path to recovery. And for those um, smart recovery, self-management and recovery training. There are people, and I've also included up here, there's one from uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and then smart recovery, it's just bottom line is be compatible with an individual's belief. Uh, we could lose them. You know, if somebody really is struggling with a gambling disorder, really wants recovery, and uh, I start talking about my faith and that doesn't resonate for them, um, it could be disastrous for them. It could turn them away from the very thing that's available to help them. So I encourage you know, myself, all of us that are in the helping services to listen and to integrate that. And if we don't know the answer, uh, there's this thing called Google that can at least help us find other resources and there's networks. Um, this is just a, a brief tasting to open your mind to, to other avenues of recovery. Easily accessible. This one, um, Gambus Anonymous started phone meetings uh, some time ago, might be 10 years, eight years now. Uh, so they have phone meetings that are every Wednesday, 6 to 7.30. They are well-managed. They are moderated by people with long-term recovery, trustees in the program, and they moderate the, the uh, phone calls. So um, that is one that is uh, approved by Gambit Anonymous, accessible all over the world. And then this is um, more phone meetings with the accessible codes. Uh, these are not, I know that's a, um, that's a messy screen and I apologize for that. These are uh, non-GA approved. Doesn't mean they're not good. Doesn't mean they're not following great principles of recovery. Uh, just in some way does not fit into the framework of um, Gambus Anonymous guidelines, um, but they are worldwide every day of the week. Um, I have been given permission to give out this contact information at the bottom. So if you'd like it, you know, snap a screenshot. I'll leave it up there for a minute. Um, there's lots of them. And I only say non-GA approved because uh, it's an important disclaimer for this group. 
okay. So <laughs> 20, the gift of 2020, 2021. <laughs> There's got to be a pony in there somewhere. This, I see some head shaking. Do y'all know that expression? There's got to be a pony in there somewhere. It's my dad always said this when I was a kid. And it was a joke that uh, the difference between an optimist and a pessimist and uh, two kids given, given uh, for their birthday, a pile of poop. <laughs> and, and the pessimist goes, what am I gonna do with this worst birthday ever? What am I gonna do? And the optimist is just shoveling away, shoveling away, shoveling away. <laughs> and they, they're asked, why are, you, why are you so happy? What are you shoveling? And they said, with all this poop, there's gotta be a pony in there somewhere. So <laughs> that's the pony. Uh, there's a pony in this COVID pandemic you know, the 2020, 2021 pandemic. Um, that's my granddaughter. So I had to include Rylan in that. She's learning to ride, but uh, there's gotta be a pony and there's an expression I've used all my life. And that's to find the good, to find the options, um, to find a blessing. So there has definitely been a pony in, in this COVID pandemic. The way that we are connecting now is part of that. And I believe our culture has, has changed and, uh, this will be with us to stay, this level of easy connection. There are virtual meetings, and this is just a short uh, sampling of them. If you go to the Gamblers Anonymous website, it shows you virtual meetings in every state. There's virtual meetings in every country. Um, there's been a great cross-pollination of people in recovery from all over the world and people in recovery from gambling disorder. And I will say that there are people that I have met that I would consider my friends in recovery whom I've never shared physical space with. The level of sharing at these meetings is, is deep and honest and authentic. Um, it's just in a time there, there's isolation and separation from others is very unhealthy for all of us, let alone people that are striving for recovery. This is a great gift. It's not going away. That's my pony. Okay. <laughs> Here's another resource. In addition to the Gamblers Anonymous virtual meeting, gamblersinrecovery.com, really robust uh, presence that has evolved online for gamblers, family, and friends in recovery. And I've really not mentioned family and friends in recovery. Um, those folks need as much support as the person with the gambling disorder. And they, they say that you know, for every one person with a gambling disorder, there's up to another 10 people who are impacted significantly, whether it's you know, loved ones, children, spouse, uh, employers, employees, uh, there's a lot of other people that need support. So they also have the family and friends in recovery. Um, look, this snapshot says Polish language, me language meeting. So many, many things to choose from just encourage you to check out gamblersandrecovery.com. And then here's a, a daily schedule for Recovery Road Online, really robust. Um, this is just a snapshot of one day and the times uh, that they have meetings. Great online platform. And I'm just pausing in case anybody wants to take a screenshot of that. So Recovery Road Online, part of my ponies. And then uh, this one, Gam Talk, has been around pre-pandemic, online support for gambling issues, to know that you are not alone. Again, it's about an online community for people with gambling issues to share their experience and ideas. Whether you are the person with the gambling problem, you need help for a friend, another great, great avenue. So that um, is a non-inclusive, not you know, unlimited list. If anybody wants to share anything that, that they're aware of that's happening right now, feel free to chime in, put it in the chat. Okay, we can talk about it later too. If something pops in your mind, put it up in the chat for us. Gambling disorder impacts anyone, anywhere, anytime. And I think uh, we hopefully all know this by now. There's no one visual of what a person impacted with gambling disorder looks like. They look like every one of us, every person in this group. So just like it's not, uh, these people are all different. The road to recovery is all different. 
So I want to talk about, um, you know, the first thing I wanted to talk about was the pathway to recovery. Now I want to talk to cultural competence in recovery. Uh, SAMHSA defines cultural competence as the ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures. We talked about that with the age groups and the ethnicity and the faith beliefs. Um, culture is a term that goes beyond just race or ethnicity. It can also refer to such characteristics as age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, religion, income level, education, geographical location, or profession. So let's talk about cultural competence. Beyond cultural competence, which I think most of us are familiar with that phrase, is cultural sensitivity. Um, I am not kidding you that I, I Googled <laughs> cultural competence, cultural sensitivity, and this was a screenshot that I grabbed. So I'm talking about being sensitive to uh, how pervasive gambling is in our culture. Uh, to be sensitive to avoiding the missteps when you're dealing with people in recovery from gambling disorder. And I Google cultural competence and this is what I get, an ace up your sleeve. Kind of ironic that it was an ace. <laughs> so do not block this door. We started off by saying there's no wrong door to recovery. But what if the door is blocked? You know, in this context, awareness of the person um, I gave the example, if I talk about my faith and somebody that does not speak to them, at, at the least it could not speak to them, at worst it could turn them off and turn them away from recovery. So being aware of the other person, using appropriate language, assuring the message is age and person or client population group appropriate and put the person first and the disease second. Um, language is being changed throughout the nation uh, in Nevada. Our language has been changed to make it uh, person first. So it's part of the law in Nevada to say a person with a substance use disorder. So rather than say somebody is a compulsive gambler, uh, they are a person uh, with a gambling disorder or a substance use disorder. It's a person with, so we're, they're not identified by uh, their addiction. So that's part of the sensitivity. So this disclaimer is that the following is uh, strictly, it's not involved, <laughs> not necessarily endorsed by uh, the, the South Kansas uh, task force. Um, it's not endorsed by anybody but me. It's my personal experience uh, through the lens of a woman in long-term recovery of when we as professionals have fallen short of being culturally competent and culturally sensitive. Here's an example of uh, cultural incompetence. If you run a treatment center, don't have a raffle. This is something I, I actually saw at an event for uh, specifically to gambling disorder. Um, for a long time, I did not share this picture because I wanted to, and Project Turnabout does, does great work. But it was shocking to me. See the flyer on the left says pathological gambling, which just tells you it's a, an older flyer and chemical dependence, Project Turnabout. And then right next to it, I didn't stage these, register to win, makes no sense to me. A target gift card, put your business card in there for a raffle. We as professionals need to be culturally competent. Those that rub up against people with gambling disorder or in the treatment field need to think it through. That one kind of blew my mind. That was at um, an NCRG event. If you study gambling disorder, don't embed flashing gambling images in your presentations, especially if your audience is comprised largely of individuals uh, in recovery from gambling disorder. I'm going on the assumption that most of the people in this presentation have a working um, understanding at least, but probably many of you are, are, have a much greater understanding of gambling disorder. But if you don't, and you're just interested in the topic, um, you may not know that you know, flashing lights can be a trigger. The things that people used to see when they were gambling um, can be a big trigger for them. So often people will <clears throat> I've seen it many, many times. They'll be presenting a study on gambling disorder. They'll be uh, 
professing you know, new information on gambling disorder and gambling studies. They'll have a slot machine, they'll have a deck of cards, uh, flashing lights. To put that in context, if you were addressing a group uh, with an alcohol disorder, a substance use disorder, you would not show a needle in your, in your PowerPoint. You would not um, have a bottle of whiskey next to your study. It's just uh, completely inappropriate. In this particular case, often the people that end up, uh, many of the people that have a passion for working uh, with people with gambling disorder are in recovery themselves. And um, at this particular event, I have seen people, literally the audience, turn their back because it was triggering all the people, half of the people in the room. If you're speaking on gambling disorder, don't present data from studies on alcohol use disorder. And that happened too at the National Center for Responsible Gaming. Um, an entire hour and a half lecture uh, broadening the base treatment for alcohol problems, research on Alcoholics Anonymous. So the research was done on people with alcohol um, use disorder and Alcoholics Anonymous, and the topic was gambling disorder. That's just, that's just unconscionable to me. And we have much more data nowadays. And I can understand that um, early days, there wasn't much data on gambling disorder. Um, but there is much more available now and it's just inappropriate to say one size fits all. This is what works for people with an alcohol use disorder. So we're gonna use it for gambling disorder. If you run a healthcare facility, don't use a slot machine to dispense hand sanitizer. That was a uh, picture was taken from um, the McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. But those images, healthcare, you know, Gambling, used, uh, gambling disorder is a mental health issue. It's a health, public health problem. And it is uh, ill-conceived to use a slot machine as the image for healthcare. This one blows me away. If you have a special offer on photos, don't promote it with a 10 year old rolling dice. Do y'all see how um, pervasive this is? Many times, you know, these are not people that are thinking, oh, we're gonna be completely insensitive to a public health issue. It's, that's the level of awareness that we currently have in our culture. And my hope today is to raise your awareness and your thinking. Um, I just, uh, I know that these people do not have ill intent, but I also know that it's time they become accountable. And, and think, and I see part of my job is to raise awareness and not with a stick and, um, but with a greater understanding. Uh, if you have a, an all recovery meeting, don't ask participants to roll the dice to see who speaks next. next. Yes, this did actually happen to me. So if it's an all recovery meeting, that means people with substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder, gambling disorder. Uh, this actually happened to be, happened to me at a Celebrate Recovery meeting. And I took a newcomer with me because she wanted to go the, the faith aspect. So the door was open. She said, I wanna find a, a Christian meeting, a Jesus-based meeting. I said, well, there's Celebrate Recovery, let's try. And thank goodness I took her cause she was new, but these are the kind of things that could really, uh, turn someone away from early recovery. Again, it was harmless from their perspective. Uh, they thought, oh, we'll see who goes next. If you're number three in this instance, you speak next, but it is socially inappropriate, culturally incompetent. So if you care about public gaming policy, don't make jokes, public jokes about problem gambling. 50 bucks says I don't have a gambling problem. That one, I, um, that one leaves me speechless. That is not funny. It's inappropriate. Uh, in the state of Nevada, in any state, they have uh, guidelines for what is appropriate um, for gaming operators. Uh, this one goes in my hall of shame. 50 bucks says I don't have a gambling problem. 
So do. The do's are consult with problem gambling experts and certified problem gambling counselors. We started with that saying, if there's a certified problem gambling counselor to work with, that's, a, that's wonderful. Um, if you are a therapist and uh, need additional training in this area to get the training and certification, but to be aware there's plenty of uh, opportunities out there to learn and understand um, problem gambling and the unique uh, situations and the unique needs of the problem gambler. Include individuals in recovery on your advisory team. I think that helps in, in many aspects, like the, the images I just showed you uh, were from my perspective as a woman in recovery and a, an informed person, I quickly saw what was wrong with that. Uh, an example current today would be the many um, lotteries for people getting the vaccine. That has been an issue uh, that there's been a lot of chatter about that many people in recovery, very uncomfortable with that because they were uh, without opting in, they were included in a raffle. And a raffle for a person in recovery from gambling disorder is, uh, is not okay. So it should have advisory people, uh, people in recovery on the advisory team. Follow the language guidelines from the National Council on Problem Gambling. We spoke about uh, using the phrase, a person with a gambling disorder. Put the person first and the disorder second. Ask yourself, would I use this language or imaging if I was discussing another addiction or a mental health issue? I think that is a really helpful litmus test. Would I use this if I was addressing a group with alcohol use disorder? I once went to a Real Recovery Film Festival and during the break, and they highlighted um, the movie, I think it's called Pilot with Denzel Washington, where he was an alcoholic pilot. Um, they had Owning Mahoney, which is about the most powerful film you'll ever see on gambling disorder. If you haven't seen it, it's uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman and it's called Owning Mahoney. But it was a great gathering all weekend of different films on addiction and recovery and support and to tee up uh, the break before Owning Mahoney came up, the gambling disorder film, the, the individual sponsoring the event said, y'all come back, we're gonna have a great movie and we'll have a raffle to see who gets the poster. I just, um, I just couldn't believe it. But those are things, those are teachable moments. I would say 90, hopefully 90% of the time I use those as teachable moments. Sometimes I just uh, snap, but <laughs> you know, somebody doing that should be aware. It really is a teachable moment. Hopefully we won't be having this cultural competence discussion uh, 10 years from now. So ask yourself, would I use that language? Would you say, come back in after the break? Well, I have a shot before we watch this movie. No, that puts it in perspective. So the, the language guidelines. Yeah, Chad. Yeah, um, thanks, B. I, in the chat, I just wanted to, to note that Ted had, had commented. Um, and Ted, are you willing to open your mic and share? Because I think it does build on what B's talking about. Oh, oh, sure. I had um, I, I had mentioned that I'd seen that uh, uh, billboard um, as well, and and someone had oh, it was Chad actually. Oh wait, no. Dorian asked, "Did you inform leaders at I guess corporate responsibility so they now know not to do that?" Oftentimes, it's usually ignorance, and that's true. I think often it's an overly siloed uh, approach to RG and PG, right? B where where people in corporate responsibility and responsible gambling are completely segregated from people in marketing, neither knows what the other is doing necessarily, and that likely got put up without you know, um, their knowledge. And then I also made the point that in Nevada, although you might think otherwise, our regulations around uh, problem gambling and responsible gambling in the industry are set a pretty low bar, really, for, for requirements for organizations. Yeah, That's all. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, and I appreciate the question, did you notify? Um, yes, yes. And again, you know, this is, is my uh, short list of examples of no's. 
uh, I should should say that it is, a, I mentioned it's a teachable moment. It's only a teachable moment if I pick up the phone, write an email, do it in uh, an effort to be kind and educate and not judge. Um, and I think sometimes, and I apologize for that, when I go through this, you can tell that it pushed a button for me because um, I've been doing this a long time and um, many that have come before me have been doing it a very long time. And it can be disheartening that we still have to have this elementary discussion. And we do, and I do, and um, yeah. The only way it gets different if we're a voice for change and take the time to follow up and it can, can get fixed, can get I, could I Could I interject something here? This is Dorian. Hi, Dorian. Um, so when I said CR, I was referring to celebrate recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have been involved in Christian recovery groups for several decades. And I've found that often um, it's very, very important when any of us see something, um, especially in Christian recovery, because a lot of them, a lot of the churches, CR is only held in churches. Um, and so they are, a lot of them are very ignorant in terms of 12 step um, protocols, um, you know, certain triggers, those kinds of things. So um, I find it to be really, really valuable to, um, you know, there's the group conscience process, which is also really important in 12 step where um, everyone, every member's voice is just as powerful as the other. There's no, there's no um, governing happening. Um, and so I found I have actually spoken up in the middle of a meeting. If I see something that's unsafe um, for any person that could be triggered. And I found that to be really, really um, healing and, and, you know, for the person that's actually experienced the trigger, um, because it also teaches them to become assertive and set boundaries for themselves, which most people, a lot of people that are um, addicted you know, have no boundaries, you know, when we first come into recovery, we don't even know what that is. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up that um, in terms of Christian recovery, I have seen a lot of, um, you know, things happen that just purely out of ignorance and not, you know, not intending to trigger or, or harm. But it's, I, I love the, the teachable moment, um, the way that you say that and, and just want to encourage people to actually speak out even in the moment and say, you know what, seeing those, those dice is really triggering for me um, right now because I, I have a struggle with this. And then um, it really helps everybody to learn and, and to grow. Thanks. Thanks, Dorian. Really great point. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so where were we? Ask yourself, would I use this language? That's what we're talking about, imaging with others. And I appreciate uh, your feedback on um, those and, and all of those examples, at least the ones in like Project Turnabout, they're committed to recovery, helping in recovery, CR, helping in recovery. Um, so it's, it's ignorance and we can make a difference. The language that um, the National Council on Problem Gambling came up with um, in fact, uh, Ted Harpo was, was just commenting, I think he was very instrumental in, in getting this language changed. Uh, that was in 2018, that professional in the media should use gambling disorder whenever practicable. Use language that puts the person first. We spoke about that. All of us were people first, disease second. Avoid using stigmatizing terms. Hmm. Anybody have any idea what that would mean? One that comes to mind to me is degenerate gambler. <laughs> I see Juan shaking his head. Um, but stigmatizing, any language with a judgment in it. Um, share the solutions that exist. That's what we've been doing here today. Provide details of the solutions. Humanize the disorder and communicate information about the multiple pathways of recovery. So the language says, it is imperative that we begin to linguistically shift the blame. That's a really interesting phrase. 
the, brain, the blame for gambling disorder away from the people afflicted. We need to redefine the way we discuss the issue so that it's the disorder that carries the focus of this burden rather than the person. Good language. So here we have um, uh, Carol O'Hare from the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling. I told you that she is my, my mentor, uh, paved these pathways by ending stigma and adopting sound public policy that encourages and supports recovery from gambling disorder. So just having the pathways is not enough. Just having the road is not enough. So ending the stigma and adapting sound public policy behind it. And that happens when, when we all are a part of, when we support education, awareness, ending the stigma so that it's okay to talk about it. And you would think that you know, this is as 2021, we wouldn't still be speaking about stigma. There's been uh, a lot of uh, open dialogue about the importance of mental health on so many levels with so many issues. And I'm hopeful that we're making progress. Um, in the past, I have been at, at events where uh, even within groups of, of recovering groups, there's been a, a stigma on gambling. And I think that that's for many people, it's because they can't understand uh, if you're not ingesting something, just stop. So that's where the education comes in that um, addiction is addiction is addiction, recovery is recovery is recovery. I think we're making progress. When talking about addiction and recovery, always include gambling disorder. So the hashtag and gambling, um, I have uh, for many years felt like I was the, the little sister in a group that would go and gambling because they, I'd be at an event that says, if you struggle or if you've been impacted by uh, addiction, or alcohol or substance use, and it's and gambling because gambling disorder is pervasive, um, has the highest suicide rate. I mentioned my passion for suicide prevention. One in five compulsive gamblers uh, has suicidal ideation. Uh, so include gambling when you're, when you're discussing, speaking up the public health impact of addiction. And that's it, that's it to just include uh, ending with you can help by including gambling disorder. Uh, hashtag end gambling is mine. <laughs> that's, I hope that that has, has opened up thoughts on the pathways to recovery, recovery, thoughts about the hindrances to recovery and thoughts about uh, our cultural competence and how we can all be a part of, of the change. So thank you. And I am open for questions, feedback, or discussion. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, Dorian. I appreciate your feedback. I have a question. Yes. So have you done any research or um, studies on the connection between childhood trauma and gambling. Um, I used to know someone who was a, had a, a gambling issue and he had a, just a horrific childhood, you know, really, really, really horrible trauma. And I know that there has been studies done about the connection between the two. And I just wondered if you had studied that. And then the other question I had was, do you find a, a connection between um, the, you know, the millennial generation with their video gaming addiction, if there's any connection with that being um, transferred over into gambling or those, those being connected at all? Yeah, really good questions. Um, I think the, you know, early childhood trauma is, is a factor in all addiction, not, not unique to, to gambling disorder, um, manifests in different ways. Um, to that point, Dorian, there's a very, very high crossover of dual addiction for people with, with gambling disorder. Um, and I'm gonna segue a little bit because we have time. Um, treatment availability for people with gambling disorder still is an issue. Um, oftentimes to this day, insurers require, they'll say we cover these substance use disorders. And if gambling disorder is the primary 
I've known people that have tried to get treatment for people and get them in through another disorder because they can't come in with, with the gambling disorder. That was a little aside, but it's, it's an important issue. Childhood trauma, certainly, certainly a factor. Um, as for the, the gaming, huge issue, um, there is gaming disorder. Uh, there's a high propensity to, to cross over into a gambling disorder because they have loot boxes. And um, Ted, are you still, is Ted still on the call? Correct me if I'm wrong, are you going to cover that next week in your talk? Yes, I'll go into that um, quite a bit, kind of the correlation between problematic loot box use and, and problem uh, gambling and some of those risk factors and what we can do prevention wise. Good, good. So yeah. hopefully you can be here, here next week for, for Ted's presentation, but he's done a lot of, of work with that. Anybody else? Yeah, B, I have a, well, a couple questions. Uh, okay. One, um, as far as I know there, you know, most of the resources we spoke about today are abstinence based. Mm -hmm. And so what are your thoughts on how to work to really bring, you know, harm reduction into the fold? It's, it's, you know, it's an important topic um, and thoughts and suggestions on that. And also with the continued expansion of sports betting and how easily it's going to be available, you know, online, um, your thoughts and suggestions on working with that as well. Thanks, Juan. Mm -hmm. um, if I can put out the disclaimer that this is through my lens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, harm reduction uh, is one of those things of, well, I'm 25 years in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say five years in recovery, my head would have exploded because I didn't think that was possible. Um, for me personally, it's not a working choice for me. I think it's absolutely a working choice in certain circumstances. Um, and I'll give you some examples. If somebody is adamantly not ready, they know that gambling is a problem for them. It's harming them. Um, and they're not ready to go abstinent, but they're open to that harm reduction. It's opening a door, right? No wrong door. Uh, a specific incident, an instance, I'll give you an example is, um, I've worked with a woman who was quite senior and she lived in a, a she had her own apartment, but in a senior place. And the big activity was a bus trip to bingo, right? And take that away is to take away her social structure, her connectivity. Um, it was a point of joy and something to look forward to in her life. Uh, it would not be effective for me to say, you can never do that. And, um, and I'm speaking not as a therapist, but as a, a sponsor and I'm a certified peer support specialist it was a working choice to say, let's try it. I knew how important it was to her. Ultimately for her, it was not a working choice, but she came to that on her own. You know, she couldn't go to a casino that had bingo and only play this amount and do the limit. But maybe some people can. And who am I to say it at least opens the doorway for them or somebody um, who might be completely re resistant to abstinence. I appreciate the question. Uh, it works in some cases. It's a, uh, yeah. Oh, and your other question was sports betting again. I know that Ted's program next week uh, deals with that extensively. Yes, it's uh, pervasive. Yes, it's right here, right? Um, that's why I mentioned the, the online help, right? And online, if we're gonna be in here and people can bet on their phone, uh, resources that connect this way are also um, pretty important and to speak to people where they are in the way they communicate. Um, but specific to sports betting, I know Ted's program is going to talk about that a lot. Thanks, Juan. Sure thing, B. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So real quick, I was just going to uh, ask Joanne, are you still on here? I guess not. <laughs> I was going to ask Joanne what um, she sees in her practice with harm reduction as far as, uh, you know, what her feeling is on that as the, as far as the percentages of, you know, how that works. I do think, um, like B, that it's a very individualized thing. So, um, 
you know, what works for one may not work for another. We have to meet people where they're at sometimes. And part of that means that you have to compromise, I guess, if you will, um, and kind of adjust the way that you do your treatment plans and, and things like that. You know, the, the end goal for me working with anybody in any kind of addiction is abstinence, of course. But for some people, you know, we may not ever get there. Harm reduction, though, can be a very beneficial thing. So it just kind of depends on, on the individual. So. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a complex issue, like you said, Glenna, because, you know, I, I was seeing clients for a little while and always, you know, kind of start off on the, the assumption that they wanted to, you know, be abstinent. And then if, you know, if their goals were different, then I would adjust from there. And it's, uh, it's one of those issues that's touchy. You know, it's one of those issues where you have a lot of the, you know, older school, you know, therapists and counselors that believe that, you know, uh, abstinence is the only way. And it's, it's one of those things, you know, as myself, uh, being a person in recovery, not from gambling, but from a substance, you know, I'll, I'll use a, you know, I still have a drink. Um, but for me, I know that it's a slippery slope. I know some people that are in recovery from a substance who cannot do any substance. Mm-hmm. And so it's it, it's very individualized and personal, and so I I try to get many different perspectives because it's 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 for some it's harm reduction is a is a non working way, and you know kind of like Lori Rugel, the great Lori Rugel, has said, keep them in treatment and keep them alive, and so. Uh, but it's 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 always a, it can be a touchy subject, and so I try to get different perspectives. Yeah, exactly. Well, and everybody needs to have some type of a maintenance plan, Mm -hmm. you know, but my maintenance plan is going to look different than your maintenance plan or B's maintenance plans or or Dorian's or, you know, anybody else's. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to always keep that in mind. You know, it's not like you get an instruction book that says this is going to work on everybody that walks through the door because it doesn't work that way. I think our job is to be open, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's just like the, the language from uh, the National Council is person first, mm-hmm. right? The person that's before us and is in need. I, lo- I love the Lori quote, mm-hmm. keep them treat and keep yeah. them alive. That's mm-hmm. right. I don't, I don't want to shut a door on anyone. If I impose something that's like my thoughts, my, my beliefs, what worked for me, I preface it by saying, that's what worked for me. Let's talk mm-hmm. about you. Right. Yeah. I wanted to, to chime in and because I think, I, I don't know if, 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 if it's the same conference, but my recollection is it may have even been the conference that I met B at. And it was a National Center for Responsible Gaming conference where Wendy Slutsky was presenting her data on, on um, the percentage of, of people that basically met the diagnostic criteria for gambling disorder at some point in their lives, but found a way to recover completely on their own, right? Without any self-help groups, without any therapy, without getting books, you know, somehow they managed to do it. And, and her finding was about a third of people who, and, and it blew my mind because I was fairly new in recovery, maybe two or three years at the most. And I got up and I really questioned her on that because I, one of my great fears, you know, in hearing that was, wow, that's really seductive to me as somebody who's, who's in recovery, what it's possible to, to do that on, on your own, or, you know, go back to some sort of of controlled gambling. And, you know, and as a scientist myself, I had to respect the data. It was good data, but it was also very much not my experience. I had tried to quit so many times on my own. I had had fits and starts in a number of different programs, uh, before I, I kind of really started my recovery process. And so, um, and it's, it is a little, causes a lot of cognitive dissonance, I think, for those of us that are in GA or other programs, because that's so far removed from our own experience and we can't imagine it's possible. But by definition, those are the people we also never see. Those are the people right. that never come into the meetings, right? Because they, they found that way on their own. So I, I don't, um, I, you know, I acknowledge that they exist uh, for sure and, and acknowledge there are likely a whole series of gradations from them to, you know, people on the spectrum beyond me. And so I think, you know, everybody's comments are very relevant here in terms of the, that, that carrot approach to just finding, finding where people are, are at and bringing them into the, the fold uh, slowly and, keeping them alive, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
that I think that is where we met and uh, she called it spontaneous recovery. Yeah, and I know, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say for me, um, you know, being in 12 steps is about doing my higher powers will who I call God. And so it's really important. Um, so like third, over 30 years ago, I used alcohol to medicate the pain of trauma that I had. I wasn't an alcoholic, but I used it to numb myself. So for 20 years, I did not drink at all. Um, and then um, I felt like my higher power was telling me it was okay to have like a, a glass of wine. And I was terrified because I thought, you know, I'm going to start medicating again. But the, the issues that I was medicating had long been healed. Um, and so I started taking a little sip of the wine and um, I didn't feel the same way that I used to feel when I was using it, using it, you know, to, to numb myself. And so I um, was able to, I, I drank like, I don't know, a half a glass. And when I started to feel lightheaded, I was like, I don't want any more. Um, and I realized that once that issue that was that I was medicating had healed and was no longer there, um, the desire to medicate was was gone as well. Um, and when I was using alcohol, I drank to get that feeling right. Like I was like, I'm going to just keep pounding it down till I get that feeling because I'm, I'm trying to get rid of this pain that this emotional pain that's inside. Um, so I can kind of relate to, you know, the whole but, but again, it's all about for me, my higher power. And if I'm ready and everybody's, you know, different in there, but the other thing I wanted to talk about really quickly was, um, uh, so I'm very, very familiar with folks that have issues with their phone in terms of, um, like porn addiction. Um, and so that is a lot of those folks can't even have a phone that they can access internet, um, because of that. And I find that there are so many people with, with phone addiction, like whenever I go anywhere in public, everyone is constantly on their phone, literally, like they're almost running into each other because their phone is right there. And I'm, and I'm realizing, you know, this phone addiction is really like out of control, but it seems like nobody wants to actually deal with it unless they have like a gambling, something that would, they would access, you know, that would cause them to, to um, relapse or be triggered. Um, and so my question is, folks that have gambling, I don't know anything about that much about gambling issues. Are there many of them that um, are part of their plan is to not even have a phone that would be able to access the internet? Mm, good question. Um, I am not, oh, I think that's an individual case by case, Dorian. Uh, the, what you're mentioning too, the DSM does, um, doesn't, mentioned as far as I know phone addiction but internet use is like uh, under consideration and it's being assessed. Uh, I think that when we say phone we're really talking internet use right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an individual if the individual uh, came in uh, addicted playing here you definitely would make you know switch to a flip phone or don't have it or make adjustments just as you would with um, make adjustments like if having a credit card is dangerous, if having cash is dangerous, you make adjustments and you have an individual plan for the person. Yeah. It, um, I think that's probably gonna be a bigger issue uh, for, for younger people that are coming in. And there's a higher rate of um, sp spontaneous recovery. People age out. Uh, if they, they have that addiction and in their early 20s and then much higher uh, recovery rate. It, is that, isn't that in your presentation too, Ted? You discussed that. Yeah. Yeah. No, a little bit. You know, I'll mention Gamban a little bit, yeah. which for people who are using technology primarily to access the gambling is a software that can almost completely block any gambling related sites you have to do a little due diligence in there and there are some issues with apple phones that that allow you to get around it and, and, and install it but it's a good tool for a lot of people who who use that primarily to to access it um so i'll talk a little bit about yeah. that next week too. not just phone but computer on the computer. yeah 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 it's again each individual i always say if people would have uh, for me I was a video poker player and until I, I, the disease was in my brain, right? 
So if you would have cut off my hands, I would have played with my elbows or my, or my stumps. It's not playing this, it's fixing this. Um, but temporarily, it, it wouldn't matter if you tied my hands behind my back, I would have found a way. And um, thank goodness I found recovery through a lot of these methods. Anybody else? Thanks for the um, lively discussion. Okay. Anything else for you, Ms. Glenna? I like your comment. I uh, understand this is a disease like other diseases is 20 to 30 years behind most understandings. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, you know, that's the uh, part of the hard thing I was going to, I was going to share too is, you know, the majority of people that we have on here today, um, not everyone, but the majority of people are, are persons in recovery. Um, I happen to be married to a person in recovery. <laughs> So I had to educate, I had to educate myself, you know, um, about how that disease affects the mind and things like that. Because, you know, how many times have you heard someone say, why can't you just stop? Mm -hmm. You know, well, it's a disease. You can't just stop. You know, if you have diabetes, why can't you just stop? Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. You have to be able to, to treat that, come up with a maintenance plan to continue, you know, keeping it in check. And so for, for the others, you know, the family members and concerned others, it sometimes takes those people a while to get there. They don't understand that, you know, it's like, what, why are you doing this? You know, what caused this? People don't consider, you know, there may have been some kind of trauma and it may not even be anything that the person is aware of, you know, initially. I've had some, um, clients that you know in sessions we're talking and all of a sudden we'll be talking about something you know from when they were younger and it's like a light bulb goes off mm -hmm. oh my gosh i didn't realize how much that affected me mm -hmm. so so again you know every everybody's different and i think that it's just a continual learning process for all of us you know as we go through life it's like you know what works like i said what works for me what works for him what works for you you know may be different and that's okay because if we were all the same, you know, life would be kind of boring, right? <laughs> so I, you know, I think it's, it's wonderful. And I have so much respect for people in recovery. You know, one of the things I, I uh, would like to mention, though, when we were talking about, um, you know, people doing it on their own, which, you know, I know a lot of people that have done that as well. But, you know, the, the percentage is pretty low that if you don't have some type of support um, you know, be that meetings, you know, family, peers, whatever, um, some kind of aftercare to follow up with, then, then yeah, your, your percentage rate of having long-term re continuing recovery drops. So that's something that we always want to encourage, but also recognize that whatever that support is, it's going to look different for everybody. So I appreciate you sharing, uh, be all the different pathways and, and avenues that there are for, for people to get that support. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as helpers, caregivers, and, and treatment providers, it's important for us to not use cookie cutter answers. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's, and I, that's why I appreciated Juan bringing up the harm reduction. It's, mm -hmm. it's not my path uh, and it could be somebody else's. It could lead them to recovery. And I did want to touch on something briefly to see if any of you think that this is experience is something that you're having as well. Um, here over the last few weeks, of course, the Olympics have been going on and a couple of world-class athletes uh, have really stressed that they took some time for themselves for their mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it really, and, you know, and Michael Phelps covered this some time back as well. And it really feels like we've turned a corner. I don't know if that's something that's going on in my own mind, but the, you know, we spoke about earlier about stigma. We spoke about these things that have been so difficult to talk about as a society. And the fact that there has been that focus that is being spoken about, uh, you know, at, at such a high level, I think has been, uh, has been a good thing. And, uh, you know, even, you know, this idea that, you know, just because you're an athlete or because you're this or that, you're supposed to 
push yourself to the breaking point, to the point where, you know, we, we've we seen sort of our, you know, kind of athletes throughout the years do things that, you know, they probably shouldn't have done just for the, for the sake of winning or, you know, that prize that we think is so important. So I'm glad to see that young people are pushing this issue to the forefront because it's important. And I think that stigma has been reduced and uh, hopefully it's not just a, a little feeling that we've turned a corner, but uh, these young people I think are, are doing a good job of bringing, uh, bringing attention to this issue. I agree. Yeah, here, here. It was some lively discussion on that too, wasn't it? The Olympics. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Yep. All right. So does anybody else have um, any more questions or comments before we wrap up here? I just wanna say one quick thing. I don't wanna be that person that everyone wishes would stop talking. So I'll be really quick. <laughs> but um, um, one thing I've learned is that we, not everyone may be in recovery, but we all, every person has an, their issues. So like, I always say I'm in CODA. And so I always say, um, go on the CODA website and look up the recovery patterns. And if you don't see any of you in there, you're in a lot of denial. So I always, I always believe, you know, and then there's people who will say, I just don't understand people with addictions, but yet for me, I was addicted to sugar. When I, when I got off alcohol, I couldn't live without sugar. I ate I know I was addicted to food. I used food to medicate. So, you know, we all have our stuff, whether, we're, whether we're in recovery or not. But when I hear people say, you know, oh, I never did drugs and alcohol or, you know, porn or gambling. So I don't, I'm not an addict. It's like, okay, let me send you this CODA link with the recovery patterns. But anyway, that's me with my um, uh, promotion rather than attraction, which is another one of my weaknesses. So anyway, thanks everybody. <laughs> all right. I Thank never you. heard it put that way. Promotion yeah. rather than attraction. That's funny. Thanks, Dory. And you're not that person. You've added a lot to the conversation. I appreciate it. I yeah. just I just want to know where you're headed he headed next, uh, B. I know you didn't talk about it. you're on this cross country journey and you're in Montana right now. But what's next? Yellowstone. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is what recovery does, right? I'm I'm free to travel wherever I want, and my husband and I have spent a year. Uh, it's a year this month that we've been traveling um, by fifth wheel. Um, and next up is Yellowstone. And then um, a three day uh, ranch rodeo in Laramie. I'm, I don't, I'm not a cowgirl. I don't play one on TV. I'm just like, that looks like fun. And they have cowboy church. You would love that Dorian. And then um, at night they have concerts where you take your own lawn chair. It's like, I am, that's another pony. I've gotten to explore uh, America. Where is this? The, I'm in, right now I'm in uh, Montana. We're going to Yellowstone and then the, uh, the ranch rodeo is in Laramie, Wyoming. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. a definite pony. <laughs> Thanks, Ted, for asking. <laughs> All right, very cool. How do I get the link for Ted's thing? Um, did you uh, sign up on Eventbrite for yeah. this session? Okay. And Robin is our community mobilizer and she'll uh, send that information out just like she did for this week's. Okay. No, I didn't sign up for TEDS. I signed up for this one. So oh, okay. I just go on Eventbrite, Eventbrite and look for it or. Yeah, did you receive that? the email that had the little flyer on it that you for, clicked on the link for this to one, register yeah. for this one? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The one for TEDS is on there too. Oh, perfect. So, if you still have that, you can just go back in and then and then just sign up for that one too. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I have one thirty-one, so we're doing doing pretty good here. So um, I guess if everyone um, is good with their answers to their questions and comments, we'll go ahead and wrap up now. I just wanted to thank all of you. Um, for coming and participating. We really uh, appreciate your attention and we appreciate B for okay. sharing her information. Um, some, I've, I've learned some new things that I didn't know. I got some new resources. I appreciate that so much. So um, for those of you that um, paid for CEUs, 
those will be emailed out to you within the next couple of weeks because we do have some people that are attending Ted's session as well. So um, if you don't get those right away, don't worry, they're still coming. And just as a reminder that Ted will be speaking next Friday the 13th and his is gambling and gaming <laughs> disorders and the youth factor. So we're excited about that too. So be to pick a date, Ted. I didn't hear what she said. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, Friday the 13th. Oh. Yeah, I, I said wait to pick a date. Well, that was that was on me. 